So, I don't want to pretend this is a podcast or anything, but are we doing a podcast? We're going to. And who's our guest today? Karen, introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Karen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you're not one. You're not one of the Karens, are you? Does not say everything. I mean, my name has been dragged through the mud of recent days. But uh, no, my name is Karen. It's Karen Temple. And um, I am really curious about humans. And so I guess my biggest experiment in life is really trying to understand humans, which is a very fascinating and doomed to failure. So how appropriate for your podcast but really, I, I do believe at a fundamental level that um, it's hard oh, yeah. enough understanding ourselves in life. And a big part of what I love to do is to try to understand what motivates and what gets other people moving in the direction that they're looking to move. Holy and, smokes. Yeah. To, are these pre-prepared remarks? No, this is just me ad lib. Oh, I see. I could go on forever. Do you want me to oh, shut up? Is no. that enough? But just you lost me already, sort of at the humans thing. I was trying to figure out yeah. why, if you like humans or talk to humans, why are you on this podcast? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, soon we won't need to. We'll just have mind reading machines, um, and 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 our and our thoughts will be criminalized against us. Um, oh my god! So who knows what's going to happen in the future? But you know, I do believe that human relations are really a foundation and a fabric, and one of the wonderful things in life, and one of the things that drive us crazy. So this should be this should be an interesting nut for you to crack because not only are you talking to two males of the species, which is which is well, the question is know, what species? Yeah, well that's a different issue. Uh, but uh, we're two old nerds too. Um, so and David's drinking whatever the hell he's drinking. Clover. But, um, some so sugar. I, I some sugar. Yeah. yeah. Th so th there's this notion that we just you know we're we don't know how to relate to humans because of our our uh, whatever we are, our, our gender identity and our um, and what we do for a living. We're technology oh nerds. Both of you have just and, taken. And it's even worse because he's a lawyer, and, and they <laughs> we know that it's that particular thing that that thing doesn't have a soul. <laughs> well, yes, I mean they are they are a special breed. Um, you know we yeah. need them, but uh, <laughs> do, do we, you're not Karen. You're not a lawyer. No, no. Really? really? No, thank goodness. Yeah, I've got friends. <laughs> Everyone's got friends. Yeah. Um, so we, I think Mark and I had an idea. This is, by the way, failure yeah. of the podcast. In case, in case you thought you were calling uh, an Uber driver, um, this is failure of the podcast. Um, and I have no idea what episode it is because we're about five, five or six behind at this point. Somewhere, be, somewhere in the in the mid sixties. No, by the time this gets published, we'll be in the mid early seventies. Yeah, yes, we're up there. So, um, but <laughs> Mark and I, I think, had differing views on what this thing was going to be about. Mark wanted to talk about, I think, your work, which is fine by me if you're willing to talk about it. And I wanted to talk about communication. So I thought it was um, a great start when you just like dove right into something that I uh, understood like one in three words of. Well, well, she's the guest. We'll let her pick. My my <laughs> thought was, um, I, I'm interested in sort of technology licensing as a sort of a, a, a thing. Obviously at MIT over David's left shoulder, they have a, a large TLO, a large technology licensing office. Um, and you know, where you are, uh, you know, you're part of a, a team that does that same sort of thing. And given that we're failure, my thesis was what could possibly go wrong? So <laughs> we've licensed, licensed some technology to some group, you know, how does it succeed? How does it fail? So that was that was sort of my the box I wanted to open, and okay. David wanted to talk about feelings or something. Oh, not feelings. No, no, not feelings. No, just kind of feelings. I don't want to talk no, about no, feelings. Not feelings. Not that crap. No, feelings just are trends. Yeah, they're not to be relied on. They're very they're very misleading. Uh, exactly. I'll say. Exactly. No, I was not, not the feelings or no, just basic communications. But we can go down. I think we can go down Mark's route if you're willing to talk about it, and then I'll occasionally interject that we're completely miscommunicating. Well, but that's useful. I, I think that um, communication is is. I mean, let's put it this way: it's how we communicate. Is when? Okay, I'm really doing a bad pun there, but and you intercepted, you interrupted yourself. We would have liked to have heard the bad pun. 
it would be failure the podcast if it didn't have bad puns. Oh well, I'm sure I'm sure we'll come up with a lot of blunders in this one. Yeah. Um, but essentially, if you if you take a group of people and put them in, for example, a technology venture, you're dealing with high risk, and I think the highest risk in those types of ventures are the failure to communicate and the failure to align. So when I work with technology ventures, whether at my role at the University of Toronto, so just a bit of background for folks, um, I do work at the technology transfer office at the University of Toronto as a commercialization manager there. And um, then I also work coaching individuals and also coaching venture teams. And I also have a podcast, which is a grand failure of my own. Um, I, I, I've go. heard about your podcast. You just had some really awful American guests. Yes. I did. And, you know, they went through the charts. I think they just pressed <laughs> a lot of buttons like the Americans typically do. And I've always said there are no better marketers in the world than Americans. Well, there we so go. Having you guys on the show just blast sure. me through all the charts. Okay. So go back to where we were. You threw me. Um, so you started off with way too many words. So you are at the... What do you call it, the tech transfer office at uh, University of Toronto? Yes. Okay, and then you also do coaching. I got to I got to simplify this. I'm translating for myself. There are a whole lot of words in there, um, and I'm just sort of this is the communication issue. You were great. You should should have been a lawyer. You are certainly able to fill up a small amount of space with a lot of words. She'd had she'd have to lose some brain cells. <laughs> okay, there we go. Right, I have to rejig myself and remind myself that I'm talking to two men. So fewer words, actually <laughs> two American men. my first comment. Let's two go. American men. So yeah. few words, shorter sentences, because if I talk to a British fellow, oh, it's absolutely we'll not a all, We'll be here all evening then. <laughs> and we'll be drinking gin and we'll be talking about the Queen and, you know, what, where the princes are off to and, you know, why the Queen's still in all your money and all that stuff. Hey, Mark, before we get let launched back into this, do you, did you see over my left shoulder now? I actually do have something useful. Do you know, recognize that building? Well, it, it, the camera moved, so. Oh, it did? Yeah, it did. It, the camera moved. But look over my left shoulder now. Yeah. I don't, I just, I don't see your left shoulder. I just see your, your ear. Oh, oh this now, is Microsoft Teams. Yeah. This is Team. They think they're smarter than we are. So I've set up this great shot with the Sloan School, which is where you teach, right, Mark? Well, I Right, Mark? I, I've given some uh, lectures there, but I don't. Teach. Okay. I don't. I don't <laughs> this is the I constant challenge. Yeah, I, I know you're trying to give me a, a some sort of. Uh, you're trying to bestow Red. some credentials Red. on me that don't Red. exist. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Microsoft. Given, Teams. given that you're my lawyer, you'd be the one cleaning up the mess anyway. Well, now that I understand that people are so nervous about um, saying they work at Sloan or do anything at Sloan, it's, I feel it's my duty to get virtually every guest on here and attribute them to some professorial or deanship over there, professorial role or a deanship. So, Karen, do you like teach at Sloan? No, I don't. Just full disclaimer, I do not teach at Sloan. <laughs> it's no fun. Okay. So, back to where we were. You see that. <laughs> okay. So, you teach. So, so going back. You are a, in the tech transfer office at University of Toronto, and on the side, apparently, they allow you to coach startups. And apparently, or, make or is that part of it? Is that so? Yeah. Is that part of the deal? Do they, if you license a bit of a bit of technology to a company, are are your services bundled in? There we go. Okay, so I'll try to keep it simple since this we is all that. small about words, communication, small Our short syllables. words. Yeah. yeah. In my role at the University of Toronto, I do coach UT Ventures until such time they leave the university and they hit the street and then they're on their own. And then outside the University of Toronto, I teach or I, I coach Ventures who aren't affiliated with the university. Okay. Ah. And you're so allowed, you, okay. That's it. That's you the answer. Through just on your own. That was very good, by the way. It was a good exercise to, you know, one or two syllable words, short yep. sentences. Yep. Okay. Um, so, may actually, uh, this may eviscerate my the whole chunk of this on communication. If she converts over to this style of speaking, I may actually be able to follow this one. Yeah, she, she might have a stroke, too. You, know, you, you never know. <laughs> Did you see that movie she, Scanners? Remember Scanners? Remember the Scanners movie? I do. I'm still, I'm still trying to watch uh, Frozen 2. <laughs> Frozen 2. It was Frozen 2. Exactly. Left foot in front of right foot. Or put the right foot forward. So you'll appreciate this, Karen, which our, our, our uh, 
view, our our listeners can't hear. My youngest made me uh, a, one of the it made me a snowman out of styrofoam cups. That is so endearing. So, um, I love it actually. It's it's cute. Does so it's the, does, it's ten does, minutes. The snowman, does the snowman have his right foot forward? I actually oh, just he just has uh, he he's he's got no bottom. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different movie. Um, it's a very different movie. Um, okay, so you, you actually do make money doing coaching outside of UT, University of Toronto. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're able to um, use our, our time and resources as long as there's no conflict with our with our um, job at the University of Toronto. Okay, oh, well, that's neat. Okay, well, tell so, us about it. Oh, yeah, Mark, so you, Mark, yeah. I have a question. Because oh. I've had some exposure to some folks up there over the years. Uh, UT, uh, from a technology standpoint, I think one of your strengths seems to be in the artificial intelligence world. Is that a, a specific focus up there? Of the uh, I don't know if it's computer science or 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 you know engineering school, but is that uh, one of the uh, one of the calling cards? Absolutely. So University of Toronto, we're very strong in AI and machine learning both through computer science, primarily computer science, but also on the electrical engineering. There's also some folks there. Um, Jeff Hinton, who is the godfather of neural networks, as they like to refer to oh. him, is University of Toronto faculty. And he began doing his work at the University of Toronto when I believe he was previously at the US, but he couldn't get funding for that type of research. And now he's also cross-appointed or affiliated with Google. Interesting. Okay. And so he's full professor at the University of Toronto, but he also is with Google. And so the university allows our faculty to be able to have that sort of structure to their. So what kind of coaching do you do? What kind of coaching of startups do you do both with the university and outside the university? Yeah. So within the university, a lot of times it's when we have a promising technology and we have some students who feel like they want to make it go out of the technology through a venture. And so what we're doing is we're working with the research teams to try to maximize the non-dilutive funding that we can pull in around the opportunity to develop and de-risk it as much as possible before the venture incorporates and hits the street. And so part of that is coming up with a development plan on the technology side to de-risk it. Part of that also is having the teams come together and seeing who really is going to stick to it and who isn't. So it's a bit of a test for the would-be founders of the venture. And then during that time also, I've started a model where we bring in informal advisors to those teams so that we understand what inflection point we're going through so that when they hit the street, they know that they are um, going to be have a higher chance of getting invested and they have a bit of they've been through the ringer at least once internally okay. can, can you break that down for me that was a, but, not, so, but, not, but not for me i guess i was trying to do a bullet point there for you Dave. oh that was good i didn't catch that i was able to follow more of the words um okay uh, I got sorry, I, that just, was I happen to be you know i love literature as well and so i do read some of the classics like Proust and James Joyce and stuff like that. And yeah, I always forget with Americans, I got to keep it short. Yeah, long sentences. You read yeah. too many long sentences. I think, Mark, Mark, don't you read the comics like I do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, short so, so, so with, us, with us, it's less Faulkner and it's more just any hey. pamphlet that you find on the street. Andy Cap, actually, or more Andy Cap. Um, okay. You know, Dave, David. Do you know that they they don't call them comics anymore? They're referred really? to as graphic novels. No, 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 no. You, no, no, no. The graphic novels are the things our kids read that have covers when they're telling us that this accepted at school. You cannot walk into school with a newspaper and sort of flip it open in the back of the room, kick your feet up on the chair and read the comics. So they're two different things, right? Ah, that sounds yeah, like no. a total made-up answer, but okay. Oh, no, that's, no, that's the truth. You cannot do that. I tried that in law school. Didn't so here's so what we've learned thus far. We yeah. are ad admittedly American dopey men, and you're actually pandering to our, our lack of ability to absorb long sentences. Right. <laughs> and we're and we're and we're and we're dealing with it. We're liking it. Okay, so it's let's no go back. 
Uh, the one thing I love about men and communication is that they are focused. They're to the point. So and you decrease the probability of miscommunication when you speak this way. There we go. There we go. So let's break that down. Um, you I, do I'm, I'm hoping that's How Jim. How you break it down? It was just three points. Oh, yeah. not bad. No, no, no. The, what she did at the <laughs> University of Toronto. Um, uh, so tell us like a sample startup. How long, How far along will a sample startup? I, I think Karen's having a little fun with us. I just want to note that for the record. Oh, I think she is. I think she is. But we're, in the end, it's our podcast. And remember, fake news. We are, is America is the capital of fake news right after Russia. Um, oh, I have a great thing about fake news. Oh, what was it? Oh, yeah. Never, I have a joke. I have a joke. And I'm the world's worst joke teller. So here's another example of failure. Okay. Okay. Why, why should you never trust an atom? Oh, this wait, has got wait. so many connotations. Is that with a T or a D? A T. No, atom, as in atoms and molecules. Come on. Oh, there's you some ADAM. This a physics major. An ADAM. This was, remember, this is going to be an ADM. This, this, this could be sort of like a biblical comment. Uh, okay. Biblical a -T -A -T -O -M. A-T-O-M. Okay, yeah, at accent. Why can't you trust an atom? Yeah. An atom. Dave? This oh, is uh, let's see, because they're always spinning around in circles. How's that? Mm -mm. Okay, Mark, your turn. You're a music guy. I went, Maybe you can I went to music on. school. I don't know anything. You know what an atom is? I do. Okay, how big are they? They're very small. They're little. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. You can never trust an atom because they make up everything. Oh. This sounds like a Canadian joke. <laughs> Definitely Canadian. Oh, that's something you tell with kids in the room. I love it. <laughs> okay. So that's go back. It. Give us a sample. Give us a give our, our one listener. Wait, you want you want to hear my one joke? What oh, do you call, sure. what do you call a bunch of IP lawyers at the bottom of the lake? <laughs> a good thing. A good start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very he, much. He always uh, tells that when I remind him of the bill he still hasn't paid. Um, <laughs> so going back to what you do, because we're, we're making slow, slow headway in this podcast. Very slow way. headway. <laughs> what sort of startups do you talk to? How far along are they? So typically, so you're familiar with TRL levels? Uh, we don't um, initials, okay. initials. We have trouble with sentences. Initials are harder. <laughs> you're a very challenging group. <laughs> can't do sentences, can't do, can't do letters, only do bullet points. Simple. Short bullet Simple. points, yeah. right. No, no initials. When the technology has been proven that it works, and I'm going to use works in quotations, in that the team has been able to demonstrate at a lab level to produce um, results that are potentially meaningful to industry. Ah, okay. So they, they've built a prototype, and I'm sorry, it's more than building a prototype. It's more than a white paper. Proof it's more than, yeah, I'm sorry, and they've had to prove, prove a prototype, they have to build a prototype, I guess. And what do they have to do to prove that it works? I'm sorry, say that again. They what? have to be able to run some experiments on the bench, on the prototype, to show, to basically prove out the initial value proposition at some level. Right. So one of the things that we really drive them on is to say, all right, how do we know that there is some potential value here? And if they have a widget and they need to run, let's say, for example, they're going to run some cells through it. Well, show me that it works. You're saying that the value proposition is the ability to do this assay and get higher throughput. So take an assay that has value in the market and run on, run, run it and show me what it can do. Now, it may not be the assay that they're going to go to market with, but just show me that it works. And show how do we me- know that, How do we know that, how do we know that, because um, that, how do, why that versus showing that the market really cares? Well, when it's- that happen? It's, it's going to be both, okay? But with all these early stage technologies, they're not at a point where the market is necessarily going to look at and say, well, I really care about that. They're going to often, they're saying, all right, maybe it's in a market where that's rising, AI, machine learning, where a lot of boats are floating right now. Um, or or maybe it's in a drug indication that they care about and there's a, there's a hope that it might 
solve that particular problem. Mark likes right? drugs. So, right, so exactly. So there's some indicators. We're not going to put a lot of time and effort and resources into them if we think that there's no market or it's a it's a pure commodities play or this is a very entrenched industry where it's going to be hard to disrupt unless we're seeing indicators that there's a model with which you might be able to disrupt it. Um, but ultimately, the technologies coming out of the university are so early stage that I'm just trying to leverage the resources at the university to de-risk on the technology side. We're not at a product point. We're not at a point where the market may care. We're, we're trying to solve something that is likely a problem that the market cares about at some future point in time. Do you get paid by the word? I was if I was a lawyer. Do you? <laughs> no, usually not. Um, his, his is a, a mysterious. Shame. You should change that. Yeah, his <laughs> is a mysterious formula that looks a lot like the taxi meter running. So you start it and the first eighth mile is, you know, $3,000 and then each subsequent inch is $10,000. Right. So well, let's let's get back to that. So let's that, get back. To that's, but that's USD. So I don't know what that is in Canadian. Let's get back to market validation. Let's get back. When does market validation occur? Well, I mean, real market validation is when you get out there and you sell. Oh no, no, no. For you right? guys to invest. For you so, guys to look, in your you, department. You get, in your what department. What's your market? Is it the investment community? Right. No. You're to sell and get money coming in. Well. I guess the here, question is okay. here. Let me help. Let me. It help. all goes back to selling. That's what I learned when I interviewed you guys. What was it? You have to be able to have thick skin. You got to be able to sell. And what was the other one, Mark? Oh, I have no idea. I made it up on the spot. <laughs> Man, well, it's codified somewhere out there in the universe. <laughs> okay, so Mark, you have to can, edit. chief Mark, editing can, officer. You you gotta you gotta make people go listen to your your podcast to hear that that you, you don't want to cut out your market in this. No, so Mark, can you translate that question? Can you translate that question? Go ahead, you go, Karen, I'm sorry, go. Can Mark, can you take my short question and make it longer so Karen can understand it? Well, <laughs> let, let me answer the question that you're, you're trying to ask, I think. Oh, really? So I'm going to ask and answer in the same way. Oh. I think what she's trying to say is- Listen closely, the, Karen. The, 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 the pro proving feasibility means does that thing this idea actually sort of work in some fashion, some minimally <laughs> minimally demonstrable it. fashion. Prototype. You and I had a bug guy on. Remember the Mosquito Man? Yep. The, 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 the Mosquito Man from the Israeli company. And for all we knew, he could kill mosquitoes, but it was like, well, who cares? Right? Well, well that, I care. Yeah, she, they bite me to death every summer. Connect me with this person. <laughs> Well, it's yeah. so that one was interesting, and it's one of our. It's Did one of the our. Mosquito here? Does that technology work on black flies? Because we we have yeah. black flies yeah. up here that are like this big, and they yeah. take a chunk out of you. They don't even sting you. They just like, and then you're bleeding. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's we like have those shark in Australia. Um, the shark in Australia. Yeah. With no, so the, the so the Israeli company uh, tries to sort certain kind of mosquito by gender using. Uh, uh, AI and machine vision, seriously, because one bites, one doesn't. What? And remember, that was. Let me guess. The females bite. That's right. So <laughs> yeah. one transmits disease, one does not. It also, it turns out. Be very careful how you answer this question. It's a good thing your attorney's here. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I, might to, I, I might have to switch based on this particular conversation. You know, I'm <laughs> but anyway, so what she was talking about was. What she works with is the stages. They've proven it somehow will work, whatever it oh, is. I got that. Whatever I got worked. That. I got well, that. Okay. That was your that was your initial question, and that oh, was shit. Your no, no, no. The question is so so we had the mosquito guys thing worked. I'm still skeptical there was a market for the damn thing. Well, uh, as long as airborne or mosquito mosquito borne diseases exist, there's a market for it. Karen's department's got to have McCarran's department's one got one. Look, there's a lot of bright, shiny objects in terms of working prototypes out there. The question is, does the marketplace care? And whether it's the investor marketplace, which you kind of hope the investors are smart enough to realize that there's a real marketplace out there. And it's not just the, the um, what do you, what's the expression with the um, the person upstream who's got even more money than you do? But you got to hope there's a, that somebody's going to ask whether there's a real market out there and whether this product meets that market. When is that done in your process, Karen? We must know. 
as I say, I at the end of the day, it goes back to to Mark's sage advice. Oh, Can no. they sell? Yeah, but it's so not. At some, point, Thank you. at some point, listen, at some point, they're selling internally to us um, yeah. to be able to get really some um, university funds and resources to help them. And and so we're looking to understand where they think there could be a potential market. We're looking to understand what is it that their technology does and what the valid value proposition is. And so at different, I think at every stage, they have to be able to um, sell to whoever it is who has money in their pocket. And so at our stage, we get them shifting their their the way they're thinking about their technology towards the market so that we're able to understand where it has a hope and hell of actually doing something. And then we're willing to say, all right, well, how are we going to actually prove that? And so one of the initial things we do with them is on that benchmarking side to say, okay, if people really do care about the mosquitoes and we're able to back calculate from malaria deaths down, and we're, we know that we're also not doing something that has like an nth consequence that actually is going to screw up the whole agriculture system because you got rid of the mosquitoes, right? Well, they didn't you know, care about that. Okay. Anyways. Yeah. So, you know, you got to go backwards to actually be able to say, well, how are, you, how are we going to prove that that this is actually going to be effective in doing what we say it's going to do? And I think you have to prove that out at a technology point and then later on at a market point and then obviously at a, at a product in the market. Um, so, so, and as you, so, yeah. as you go through that, you have to be able to, whether it is, whether you're, you're proving that to someone like me to put initial resources in or you're you're you don't convince me and now you've got to go and convince somebody else but at some point you have to convince somebody to part with the money that's in their pocket or that they have control over nothing and happens how, until somebody sells something how, mm -hmm. long into world process, number one. how long into the process has that occurred with you guys so it's stage gated i was just so, going to ask if you follow that 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 technology to, uh, so you know stage that gate to, cycle thing so I, that's got two stage gate two syllables too big for me explain it so StageGate is the trademark name, um, and that's that's for product development, new product development. Um, if if you don't want to follow that prescriptive one, um, PhaseGate. So we PhaseGate things. So initially, we get an invention disclosure if it's coming through, and they want to have patent protection around it. I always tell people at the university, not everything needs a patent. Not all businesses need patents in order to become a business. But if if it's a technology space where they're going to be competing and they want our support, that's gate number one. We do not patent everything that we receive. And so there's a, there's a bar that they have to meet. And part of that is looking at what problem are you solving? Who cares about this? How are they currently solving that problem? And who else is thinking of an alternative, better, faster, cheaper way to solve that problem? And so then we do a, an assessment and we make a decision whether we're gonna file or not. Then every year, and as we go through the patent process, there are gates, and we're looking to see that 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 the team, the inventor team that wants to make a venture around this, is actually advancing the technology. They're not simply a year later saying, "Yeah, we haven't really advanced it. We haven't done anything with this." So we like them to come up with some level of a roadmap on what are we going to do while we're still at the university. That's going to cause me to say to my boss, "We need to put more money into this patent portfolio." And we need to put some money into the wannabe company, and we need to be able to find some development dollars for this group. Hold on. So, I know too long, right? No, oh, I just yeah, I guess what I'm getting, it actually here's makes where sense. I'm I'm stuck. Here's where I'm stuck. Okay. I feel like on the patent side, what you're saying, I mean, all those are the right answers on the patent side, irrespective of whether this is actually, you know, really comes down to exactly what I said, um, which is. How do you know there's a market for this before you invest in it? Or are you cognizant that you don't know there's a market for it? Listen, we're, we're making our assessment based on what we know, and there's most of it is what we don't know. Okay. Um, we typically do try to reach out to industry in a non-confidential way to find out, is this even on their radar? Like, am, am I talking to them? And I'm, I'm having, and those aren't easy conversations to have because we're trying to communicate the technology value proposition to a problem that may exist now, may exist in the future. 
But if it's not ringing any bells, and I'm looking also at the market research reports, the secondary market research reports that I can glean from, and this is this is just flat, then it may be better that the results are just published. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to put support behind it for patenting. Where in the process does that um, not on the patent side, just on by the way, your investment you've got two investments, one of time and one on the uh, IP portfolio, correct? And we also um, have the ability to um, give development dollars to the research teams. Oh, how significant is that versus uh, portfolio development? Are these big dollars or pretty small dollars? In the grand scheme, they are on the smaller side. So we typically will invest, we have a fund um, that will invest about 100,000 in Only. Canadian dollars, right? So. So it's about 85, 83,000 USD. Yeah, the exchange rate's a little bad now. Yeah. But anyway, so minus. Um, and into a particular technology. We also have government funding that uh, for a phase one would be like 125. And if you go up to further phases, you can go up to 250, 500. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's money. I mean, it's not millions, okay? If they once they start getting into wanting to raise millions, then you're talking to your seed round investors. So my question is, if if you've uh, infused some funds into the into you know whatever the startup is or the, the mosquito thing, is, the mosquito thing, or or whatever, now um, does that change your equity interest at this stage? Hmm. Hmm. So mm. that's a great question. Oh, just that so, color mark. Round of applause. I can go home now. Oh, wait a minute. I already am. The work is done. <laughs> Keep going. So it's interesting because a lot of universities are taking equity into the ventures that they license their technology to. And University of Toronto is no different. Typically, we prefer to do equity plus royalty type deals. Again, it depends on the sector as well. And right. But typically what I'm doing on those deals is I'm looking at all the areas where we've either um, deferred cash or reduced cash outlays on the deal and converting that into, into the equity consideration. Okay. So if the university has, for example, paid for patent costs and, and let's say for some reason we're willing to continue paying for patent costs in exchange for equity, then that gets included into the equity consideration. Um, if we've been able to to provide development dollars into the venture, then we'll take that into consideration as well. So is it, uh, that, that's interesting. So is it also true that, let's say the scenario is, you know, I'm a professor and I've come up with some great solution along with my uh, research team. I've come to you to, uh, uh, memorialize that I've I've created this you know invention widget X whatever, and um, I've come to you for based on the stage gate analysis I've come to you for some funding. So, it, but my question is is does that and I know David's background was a little loud just now. Um, do, does that change the royalty structure or does that change the equity structure or is it is each deal unique? Mark, you've used so many words in that question that I'm lost. If I'm a I had to unplug my, I had to, I had to unplug my headphones, Mark, because you you blew them out. Okay, let me. Let I me thought reduce it was Karen it. talking. I thought maybe there was like a a tone shift going on. Do you have that thing? What's that? What's the tone shift thing called? The okay, let me try this. Let me use my. Let me take a sip of my own medicine here. If I invent something, if I'm a professor there, and I need money at different stages. How does that impact my royalty and equity structure with you? Oh, Go ahead. So, She's thinking. <laughs> so listen, if we're if we're seeing that the research group is continuing to advance the technology and not do research for research sake around the technology, right? But they're actually helping to prove out the technology and de-risk it then we're willing and we see that the venture team is forming around it we'll continue to put 
resources behind it. All the resources are competitive, so they have to compete for them. Now, as before, usually I would wrap that into the equity consideration and keep the royalties based on um, typical royalty rates for that type of product in that type of sector. Okay. So my, and that was leading to this question, you know, we're failure of the podcast. So, so what could go wrong? Could go wrong? And, what happen, and what happens? What, what, what can go right? What can go because right is my wit, my widget is accepted by the market and sells a hundred million dollars worth. And that's amazing, right? Cause then everybody wins. So the inverse is it's taking too long. So failure could either be it's taken forever um it's you know in a in a non-stop gestational cycle or the thing just flops nobody gave a crap exactly so and that's the beautiful thing about about capitalist market and free markets is that you have to be able to convince somebody that this is a problem that they're willing to solve and if you're not able to do that you're not even able to get to a point where you're selling product so each step of the way is a gate and that comes back to communication because unless you can communicate what it is that your product does and why shouldn't somebody part with their money, then you're going to not pass that gate, right? You're not going to pass that inflection point. You're going to slide back down to the other one, and then you're going to pick yourself up and figure out what else to do. And that's so okay too. Why do, um, I'm trying to think, we, we may have a listener and we don't know the listener. Um, it's my mother. <laughs> that's okay. Well, that's Karen's pretty. mother. She may be good. She may be good for this. Then. You must be very proud. <laughs> not in the university environment. And so if I were listening to this conversation, I am vaguely listening to it. Um, I would think that patents are important. And of course, since that's my business, I do think they're important. But yet, yet a lot of the discussion. Interest statement. <laughs> yes. But a lot of the, no, no, but I'm. Oh, he froze up. Conversation, I would think to myself, wow, patents are really super important, and you guys are investing in them, and I'm trying to understand why you're investing so early. And I'm not saying that's wrong, and there's a bunch of legal questions in there, but let's not get into them. Why? He keeps freezing up. Because we have your mother, for example, may not be in the university environment. It may not be working on Way AI. Way too many words. Wait, I'm going to... I'm gonna pull. I'm gonna pull a Karen on you. The, too many words in that sentence. Right. I know. You're asking. Can you point is, rephrase, um, Mark? Can you rephrase the question so that I can understand it? I don't. I don't make, think anybody understands it. I don't think David knows what he's saying. I think you guys are in. You at the university are in a unique market, as is, as we are here at MIT. But it's a unique market where patents probably matter almost no matter what they matter. Oh, but his question is, do, pa do patents matter? No, 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 but for one listener, if they probably aren't that important, correct? For one listener who may not be in the university. And you guys are putting a lot of money into them without knowing whether there's a market. I think that's what, bother what bothers me here, which is failure often occurs, most often occurs for a breakdown in the conversation between the entrepreneur and the marketplace. In other words, he came to the market with the wrong, wrong damn product. And already though, you've already pumping money into the patents. You're pumping money into a whole lot of stuff. Shouldn't there be a better way? Hey, do I get points? No. There should be There's a better, be way, to better find way. There we go. And yeah. Karen, you're at you the heart of this all. It's your fault. Actually, we like that. We like it's your fault that yeah, patents are Yeah. Early. Well, I know there's the, the blame culture down in the States is, is really big right now. So I'm not surprised yeah. we crossed that. Um, we're, we're in the cancel culture. Cancel culture. Yeah. Cancel. yeah. I still don't, well, that's I still okay. don't know what that means. You can just delete the whole episode, right? Cancel me. Yeah. Um, listen, there's risk everywhere. When the, when the in fact, Series A puts their money in, uh, I'm floored sometimes when I see Series A investment go in. And I'm looking at this saying, this technology doesn't even work yet. They're putting money into this. Yeah. The number of venture capitalists who don't do proper te technical due diligence floors me. Why, okay? do you focus on, why do you focus on whether the technology works and, as opposed to whether there's a market? I keep coming back to that because it's my- They're I'm both important. They're both important. 
But when do you find that out? Because I, I think it, the angel group I sit in with, we're pretty much, not always, but pretty much want to see that there's revenue. We want revenue. We want to see there's revenue, which means they'll eat the dog food. And I feel like the University of Toronto scheme doesn't require that there be revenue, doesn't require proof that they'll eat the dog food. Because she's earlier than you. She's earlier than an angel. But she need not be. Okay, so tell me how you how you take some of these technologies and show that you have revenue. And I'm assuming from product or services sales, you're referring to revenue, not investment. Yeah, correct, correct. Okay. So, yeah, how, I agree. Do, how do you get revenue when you're not even through product development? Yeah, well, I and guess the um, software play, sure, you can get some some trials with you know the various telcos, for example, or the various technology companies that deal with AI, right? Where they're trying to actually smell whether you got something. Sure. If you have, if your technology is two is two brains in a computer, you can get to market pretty fast through some trial usages, for right. example. I'm thinking of minimal viable product and I'm also thinking that Mark can tell us how Airprint did it. I know that you guys that was my company. company. That was his company, failed company, but it failed for other reasons, I think. It did not yeah. fail for so at the university we don't get to a point where people have products that, that they can manufacture and sell. Okay. We're technology creators. Well, and so our to create their- technology and that often those technologies go into some they have some product concept for it, but they're not at a product they're not even at a product development. So if you think of when I think of technology commercialization, I think of a series of sw- swim lanes. Okay where you've got your technology development and de-risking, you've got your product development de-risking, you've got your market product development de-risking, and then eventually you've got, you know, just your sales, your sales and marketing, okay? And you've got right, revenue. Describe the stage and, and, right, and, and it's not in sequence that you do these things. They're in parallel. But while I'm in technology development, I may be doing, I don't know, X percent Pro, thinking about product, how the hell am I going to put this and integrate it into a product and show that I can actually manufacture it and maybe even sell it at a, at a profit? Now I'm starting to think about the market. Well, who, right? Who's going to pick this up? Then I got to figure out the value chain, the supply chains, right? Well, why, don't you so, turn, why, don't you, why don't you say to your, your the professors or the uh, grad students, sounds like an interesting idea. We'll fund a provisional application. That'll buy you, and you guys don't have provisionals in Canada, but you can file one in the U.S. anyway, and that's, uh, you're effectively part of the U.S. anyway. So you could file a provisional here, and you give it a year. Um, Karen, sorry. Karen, sorry. I just had something in my throat there. <laughs> and come back, come back after you can show us that somebody cares about this thing. In other why don't you treat yourselves more as investors and less as a university? And I know you are a university, but I'm just curious. You could save a lot of money. No? Am I missing? Do you want to follow my point? You I, look, the, the, the biggest problem you have, David, is that you've never actually built or sold a product because that's not what you do for a living. You, you come in to document an invention and protect it at, well, at, at a later stage no, than no, no, that's, parents. That's not fair at all. That is true. That's certainly a function I, I carry on. But I talk to tons of people. I, I listen to a lot of pitches that are made to angel groups to get money. And oh, I, I, have, I think I've picked... Oh, you're getting all choppy Some... work-wise. I did that on purpose. <laughs> he was talking too much. Yeah, that's very <laughs> smart. That's her new invention, which is the David filter. <laughs> yeah, but my patent pending. Why don't you treat yourself more as investors? She, she already and- filed the PCT filing. <laughs> oh, he keeps yeah. freezing up again. I guess I guess it's a good filter. I haven't I haven't been filtered works. out yet. My technology works. <laughs> I love yeah. it. She's proven so, feasibility. Okay. Our work here is done. So wait a minute. Let me step back. Mark has seen. I'm going to try to draw Mark in. I'm going to. This is my subtle psychology. Um, There's nothing and subtle about Mark- you. Mark, you've been both in industry yeah. and you, for the MIT Enterprise Forum, I'm amazed you haven't mentioned it today. And you've actually seen investors in action. And you know that investors have a different set of metrics yes. than universities do. And I'm just curious why universities could not apply that same metric. Well, actually, let me back up. I'm going to question the last part of your question. They don't necessarily have a different set of metrics. They're just at a different stage. 
I think the metrics are identical. Uh, just you, they all recognize what stage the thing is at. Hey, I disagree. I di I, so I hear what you're saying. I think I think what you're saying seems like the easy Karen? answer, and it doesn't right surprise. You jump in anytime you want, Karen. Yeah, Mark, you're right. We got we got David on the filter again, so we can say whatever we want. I love it. <laughs> hold on, that's, Mark, you're right. Are the best three words I've heard today. Well, hold on, but but you don't need to be right. I think that that def that people go along with that because it sounds easy, and I think they go along with it because Karen's actually got a, in her group have a different function in this whole process. Their function is not really to see. I pressed it again. <laughs> <laughs> this this episode blurb's going to write itself. It's going to be called the David filter, patent pending. I already I already I can see this one. It writes itself. And we, <laughs> yeah, and it's working again. I love it. By the way, am I breaking? No, yep. yeah. Demonstrate that it can work on other people. Maybe yeah. name David. Maybe not. Then I got to market. I'm going to yeah. sell this. Pan hot pancakes. Yeah. I think I think his wife is probably customer number one, <laughs> <laughs> and then his friend Mark, customer number two. I'll, I'm not I'll, getting I'll, into my question. Uh, let's uh, is let's there another model. Is there another model? Listen, Mark, I'm going to ask this: Is there another model by which a university technology licensing office could run? That's a yes or no answer, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They pro I I think it's I think the answer is probably, but well I want to hear it I want to hear why they don't do it actually I think I know why they don't do it, but I think that uh, it has a preconceived idea and point to be made. Okay, David, why don't you just um, avoid all the questions and just say what you think? <laughs> this is the best podcast we've ever done right now. It's good. I well this is communication. Um, I think that you guys are an arm at the university and serve to fund research. And and that some of that research may be valuable, but that you are heavy on the technology side because I'm not quite sure why you're heavy on the technology side. I'm not sure why you fund. I'm not. Let me ask you this. Do you guys ever commercialize um, your IP that doesn't go into a working company? You follow me, Rembrandt's in the attic? So when you ask us if we commercialize our IP that does not go into a company, the University of Toronto actually has a very interesting example. Um, and this goes back to our discovery with insulin about 100 years ago, where yeah. the university actually started manufacturing and selling insulin. Yeah. Um, there was a farm north of Toronto where we were doing that. And um, then at some point, um, the bodies that be figured it was probably not a good idea for a university, given our status with the government, to be manufacturing and selling drugs. Ooh, um, so we sold that business, obviously, to Eli Lilly. And um, the result of that established the Connaught Fund. And the Connaught Fund is now um, where we pull some of our internal funding for our venture opportunities. That's interesting. That's yeah. That that's the story I would have started with, but we can fix that in the edit bay. <laughs> oh, we're not. <laughs> there's gonna be no editing of this. Um, so what? Would and, you and we've also had other examples. Okay, so for example, you want another example? Here's one. Um, copyright is owned by the faculty, so yeah. we don't actually own it. Fa faculty run it, own it, and um, one of our professors out of our psychology department. His name is uh, Jordan B. Peterson, and he is completely killing it on YouTube with his content. Hmm. Okay, so I guess maybe this is another question. To what extent is the university model applicable to um, startups outside the university? Sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, it's just a variation of my other one because I'm kind of stuck. Um, well, do you, uh, David, are you asking, it, it, you know, is that model also available in non-university settings? Oh, I'm it saying, is. It is. It is. Yeah, like Google has oh, yeah, pure yeah, yeah. research and yeah. Microsoft yeah. has pure research and, you know, other large companies. And sometimes they 
commercialize it. Sometimes they spin it out. Sometimes they kill it. Yeah. If you look at IBM, they still have a really large patent portfolio, for example. Right. So I guess what I'm coming to conclude, and you must have figured this out like 10 minutes ago, and I'll, only I am just now beginning to conclude this, is the same thing I said a minute ago, which is... Tr trigger the, the filter. The um, TLO <laughs> office, Technology Licensing Office, where you are, the Tech Transfer Office, really serves to promote technology, maybe firstly and secondly to promote uh, companies. Don't you think it's really to promote the fact that University of Toronto is a great research institution? Yes. Which attracts yes. world-class students yes. and faculty, and yes. the other stuff is sort of and, interesting. And companies. and companies. And companies. Okay, but companies are not necessarily, it's not necessarily the filter you apply to the companies you'll fund is not necessarily the same filter investors might apply, correct? They may be and companies that are sponsors, you know, just like- well, we don't. We don't give the companies money <laughs> just for the you do. Oh, you do, don't you? You get money from the companies if they want yeah, to sponsor we, things. No, 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 you, do, but you give the startups money. You give the professors money in the labs. Correct? They mm -hmm. might, a company, an external company might endow research or endow a chair in a, in a particular discipline or topic, I'm assuming. Sure, or do sponsored research, collaborative research with the university. Yeah, do you have metrics for all this? So there are metrics that that you measure the performance of the group by, the licensing office by. Yeah, of course. Can you get into those at all without uh, having I mean, to shoot us? I mean, they're they're all public through Autumn, but I mean, I'm not sure what exactly it is that you're looking for. Investment. What return on investment? So that fluctuates as you probably are aware with every university, okay? And so typically what happens, as you probably also know with patents, is you have a very few select group of patents that actually have huge commercial value, and the vast majority have diminishing values, and there's a very long tail to that. And so University of Toronto follows a similar trend as any of the top U.S. universities in that we've had some really, really good deals that have brought in some sizable checks to us, but there is a long tail. And what I usually say, and it goes back to Mark's point, because Mark is, again, Mark's, Mark's right, is that the university, we are a research institution, and we rank top globally year over year, and we are also ranking very well in the Thompson Innovation um, University rankings as well. We've been going up every year on that. And so with the TTO offices, I always say, we're not like a pure investor where we're looking for just a basic 10x dollar return. We are able to, through being able to show our, our patents, being able to show our licensing deals, being able to attract industry here, we're able to provide our researchers and our students with exposure and opportunities to learn what does it mean to invent and to create new technologies and to be able to think about them from the way that industry and the market views it. So rather than just basic research for basic research sake, which is also a big part of what we do at the University of Toronto, we're also preparing the students and the faculty for the economy. We want these students to be able to create companies and bring products to market. We want them to, whether they join a company or do it on their own, we want them to understand what does it mean to take a technology and to convert it into a product or service that you can sell at a margin. Because that's where the socioeconomic benefit comes from. Our universities are heavily subsidized by the government, otherwise known as taxpayers. And we want to have a strong, profitable economy. And for a world that's moving into, the, into um, technology, it's all about technology now. Uh, in order to compete, the patents play a really critical role. And I know that you'll agree with that, David. No, I think I've, my view of this has changed. So I walked into the conversation thinking that you, the TLO office, was very focused on, like investors are, on funding and funneling um, professors and labs into successful positions in the marketplace. And I'm not sure that's true, and I'm not sure that's bad. I, I, th I just think she shattered your your 
your um, preconceived notion. Because yeah. uh, you know, so what she basically talked about is a, a broader societal benefit uh, for for uh, the country, really. Which um, again, the school that's over your shoulder does something very similar. And I mean, I think a lot of the top schools, you know, the elite schools worldwide have similar orientations on that. You know, it's it's a virtuous circle. So more research brings more students, more students brings, you know, inventions, inventions bring dollars through licensing and patents, bring, you know, corporate sponsors who bring more students, who, you know, blah, blah, blah. These, but, these are all long-term economic plays. Yeah. And make, it's, Both for the university and for the the fact that we are um, publicly funded. Yeah. Do you does the filter you apply early on, which is show me a product that show me a prototype that does something, or at least that, that does what you uh, does something you think might be useful? Does that filter out basic research, which I would think it does and should? Filter out. Yeah. Filter no, out. No, it, it doesn't filter out. Essentially, there's this, the R&D, right? There's the research and there's the development side. And all we're doing is shifting the focus of our researchers from just pure research. Why does something happen? Right. To helping them to answer how does something happen? What would happen if Einstein showed up with E equals MC squared? What would you say? He, he so Einstein shows up um, and he says, I've been thinking all night about this. As a matter of fact, I haven't cut my hair nor my mustache. And lo and behold, I've discovered that E equals MC squared. What would you then say to him? Okay, so I'll give you an example with Jeff Hinton. For the longest while, when he was in the States, he couldn't get funding for his neural networks. Comes up to Canada, and Canada says, hey, we're going to fund this. Okay? Cool idea. He's able cool to. Idea. Cool idea. We have no idea how the hell this is going to impact anything, but part of what the university does is research. A big part of what we do is research. We create knowledge that we hope will have social and economic benefit as part of it. we also are graduating students right there's all that to our yeah. business model as well okay and and he's developing the neural net networks nobody really cares about it then all of a sudden it starts getting traction in in the peer review journals right with other researchers and other people coming around it and then at some point we started patenting on it and um and that proved to be a very wise decision that we made when did you, did the tech, tech transfer office at UT get involved in his stuff? Not when it was a fundamental idea that is a white paper. When did he, when did he walk in the door? At what point in his process, if he had walked into your door several times, at what point did you say, okay, you're a good candidate for us? Well, I, I don't have, you know, his timeline right in no, front of me. No, but roughly, I mean, make it, it up. It would, been, it would have been when we're starting to hear that AI is picking up, that there's actual applications that could use this. And often if it's one of our top researchers, so we have some really high quality, top ranking global researchers, and if they're coming to me and they're saying, hey, I've got, and I've got some researchers doing this already, and like, let's say they're in quantum, and they're saying, Karen, I think there's something that could be here. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick the can on this. I'm gonna, put a file, file something on it, and then let's see as we go. It could be that in a certain point in time, we may see that the market shifted and it doesn't make any sense to hold it, we might drop it, or maybe we're just gonna hang on to that little one for a long time. There's a great example actually out of Boston, out of Boston U, where yeah. they had a change in their office, somebody came in and they did a complete review of their portfolio, and they found this one patent, I think it was year 18, that has something to do with LEDs. Hmm. And so they dug around and found out that this technology is, is pretty pervasive in a lot of LEDs. So then they started knocking on the doors and all of a sudden the checks start coming in. Well, they became so, a patent troll. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's about time they collected on, at least they exactly. they, they went and did that, right? Most only rings once. So to what extent do you, um, when you're, say you were the, not the provost, but the um, chancellor, I think it is, of the of University of Toronto. Oh, actually, first question. There, a lab or a professor can get funding from the outside, grant funding, could be government funding, it could be funding from a, um, a company, uh, but they can also get funding internally, for example, for your, from your department. Are there any other internal funding sources other than your department for funding a lab or a professor? Are you speaking really broadly here? 
what we're known for. I was for. trying to keep it short. Oh, it, it was just... <laughs> but do you follow why? the question? Why? It was I, I'm try, I'm trying um, to figure out where you guys fit in. because It was intentionally broad and vexatious, as lawyers yeah. would say. <laughs> well, I think I'm trying to figure out where is the technology licensing office of University of Toronto, and therefore of universities in general, the means by which the university takes advantage of its own funding sources to promote certain labs and certain technologies? Or are you just one of many sources that internal sources from which a lab can get funding? And I'm the verbose one? Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> question made sense. You followed it. I'm trying Where to figure else do they get their money? Internally. But internally. Internally. And, and are you speaking, you're speaking for everything that a researcher does, right? Yeah, well, like, I'm talking about, that's yeah. why I say yeah. your question's not specific. Like, if it's everything, I mean, the researchers, are, um, there's not a variety of different... I don't care about pens and paper. I'm, I think about large sums of money on the order of tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars to move a lab forward, to do research in a lab. Where does that money come from if it's internal? Just your department or are there other departments? No, there's others. Absolutely. Like, like what? Uh, our, listen, let me, I'm going I'm to answer your question, but I'm going to answer it from the context of what, what's the purpose of our group. Okay. So our, uh, you know, because there's, there's umpteen different, we're very decentralized universities. So we're massive. Our student population is about 85,000. Wow. Okay. And it's decentralized which means that the, the power really sits at the department level. We're, our office is funded by the departments. If they don't think that we're doing anything for them, they're not gonna put a budget line in for us, okay? So, so in turn, um, there's, there's budget that sits at the department level. There's also various internal um, foundations, okay? that the university, um, that uni university faculty can compete for. Um, there's also a lab set up. So if a new faculty comes, they're partnered to and mentored with another existing faculty members. Um, and there's a fund that allows them to be able to get their lab, get their lab going and set up properly. There's obviously awards that recognize those researchers who are top in their, in their game, whether it's through teaching or whether it's through publishing their peer review um, journal articles, um, but the vast majority of the research dollars that come into the university are coming from government sources and industry. But they don't go. But those and do those monies go straight to the labs, or do any of those monies come to your department? No, they don't. That money doesn't. We don't see that. She has the only a time it will come I to think. us is is periodically if we have. Um, Sometimes with industry money, they'll they'll pay for some of the patents that are part of the background IP if they want to hold them. Okay, but no, our our money our money flows internally um, back from the departments. They're okay. our customer. They're our internal customer. David, so the, go ahead, Mark. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna interject and shift us slightly for the remaining eight hours of our second half of our podcast. Karen said, "Thank God." Um, well, because I think I I, I think she kind of answered it. Um, we were also going to talk about we'll, communications. We'll on that afterwards, Mark. He's, he's, got a, he's got an axe that he's grinding. I'm just not sure what he's trying to chop I'm with. Trying to to me at the university. I'm <laughs> trying no. to from the chancellor of the university where I should put my dollars as I allocate them among the various um, David, here, tools. Let me help. Yeah. She, her department is, has a service function. It is... Yeah. It, it, it is enabled by money that the other, like physics and engineering and music and God knows what other departments feed well, them. Not contribute, but okay. Well, you'd be surprised. Berkeley College of Music also has a, uh, a technology licensing office. So okay. that's why I mentioned it. But all, and I know having been on the campus, you guys have a little music school too. Um, we do, and actually they're, they're involved. Um, they've been doing some work with an AI group on copyright. Say it for the second time, Mark was right. Anyway. Um, Mark was sorry. Oh, <laughs> David. It's torturing David. So, I'm going to shut up, Mark. Take us somewhere. Okay. So here, yeah, here's where I'm taking it. So we, we were also going to talk a little bit more about communications, and and one of the <laughs> one of that the, was the underlying <laughs> theme here, Mark. Did you figure that out? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but uh, here's podcast? here's the thing. So does your office? <laughs> it or, sounds better. Mark. Thank you. How does your office help the oh, inventor, the professor, the nerd? Uh, articulate their 
offering? Do you, is that part of your, your one-on-one -on -one coaching? Is that a departmental function? I think no, Karen's so coming down with coronavirus. She's leaving. So, yeah, no, we're actually doing really good with coronavirus. I think it's because we we blocked the border with the with the Americans. We're um, like an upper colony down here. Yeah. Trust me, it's the right move. <laughs> Did you hear about the guy from Kentucky? So apparently, Americans have a loophole. We should probably cut this from the broadcast. I don't want all you guys coming up here. But well, there's, he watches there's, his podcast. <laughs> there's a loophole where if you get to the Canadian border and you say that you are on your way to Alaska, you're allowed in. I did hear I about that. Fix that. Yeah, I well, thought they fixed that. You're supposed to go to the most direct route possible. Well, this yeah. guy, this American from Kentucky, he starts hanging around Banff. Oh, and well. he's not, <laughs> he's going, apparently he has some girlfriend up here, okay? And he's he's not Here. going to Alaska. He's visiting his girlfriend. So oh. the RCP, RCMP come and they issue him a ticket. It's like two thousand bucks Canadian, right? And he's like, ah, that's probably like two bucks American. The American dollar is so strong. Right? Who cares? And so then he doesn't heed the warning. And then the hotel calls the cops again. Yeah. So day two, they slap him with a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine. <laughs> Holy crap! I did hear about this. It was in the paper yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, it would have been it would have been worse if he was like in you know PEI or something, because then he'd really be in the wrong direction. <laughs> so yeah. we don't know if the podcast has a point, but Mark has asked a question, and Karen's attempting to answer it. So, so she's done. The question is, how it's do you simple. help your nerds communicate? Yeah, it's yeah, a simple. So, we'll let you go. So it is. It is. That's part of what we do. Is we're working with the researchers to help them translate and move away from being technology experts to actually beginning to think about what is the product and what is the market. And, um, and so at the University of Toronto, we have a number of ways that we do it. Our office obviously does that. We work really closely because, hey, we're looking for these potential venture teams to actually advance things for us to continue putting support behind it. And every time that we're, we're um, they're competing for internal dollars for this venture opportunity, they're having to actually answer those questions um, as part of their competitive process, whether it's through a proposal, it's not a research proposal, it's a development proposal, it's a commercialization proposal. And so, and then we also have external people come in who look at those proposals and rank and decide who, who merits getting um, the internal funding. They make recommendations, we make final decisions. Um, and that's a big part of what we do with our accelerators. I think I can translate that. I think I actually understood that answer. They, at every stage in the process, the entrepreneurs, or what I guess you call them researchers, at every stage in the process, process, the researchers are forced to prove why this thing has value. And as, as a result of these, of constantly having to state that and prove it, they actually learn how to present and implicitly then they learn how to present to investors. Well, let me, right. let, me, so let, me then, let me diminish it further. They help nerds talk good. There you go. Well, like through successive, yeah, by, so by making them prove their point. That's yes. so American. The other way of looking at it, as the British would say, is when you'd like to herd cats, you move the food. Ah. Okay, hold on. Does that relate to this? I'm slow. That must be Faulkner must have That's done okay. that. We'll give you a day or two. Let me know. Email me when it when it gets. <laughs> okay, when it hits. Okay. Ring the bell when you've gotten the answer. <laughs> okay. So what have we learned? I like that. That oh, was Pavlov. Yeah, yeah, was it? Okay. Um, yeah. What have we learned today? We've learned what that she she's now done two podcasts with us, yeah. and she'll probably not want to do a third. That's what we've learned. Yeah. Okay, but what what was the? I on the other hand would do would would do endless podcasts with Karen because. I, I think we found the, the foil that flummoxes you the most. I think it's because she tells you you have good questions. Well, hey. that didn't hurt. Oh, no, no. She says you're right. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's better. That's the ultimate compliment. I will argue that what we learned. It's the we learned ultimate anything. compliment when, when yeah. you're talking with someone negotiating and they say, you're right. You're right. Um, what did we so learn, Karen? Well, okay, just in case people have gotten this far and haven't shut up, shut yeah. off the podcast, which is oh, hard. Like, people, right? Jumped off a building. Okay. Yeah. I mean, failure is failure is uh, highly probable and 
in all of this. In this podcast, yes. But since we did start talking about communication, I thought I'd share one small little framework that I use for communication um, that has served me so well. And I think people listening to this would be able to relate to it. So, as you know, I'm also a propeller head. So I tend to think in terms of two axes, X and Y, right? Four quadrants. And if along one axis, you think about communication style and you think about somebody who is abstract or concrete. And then on the other axis, there is what you call random and linear. You've yeah. heard this. Mark, sh Mark shaking his head. Yes, oh, I have not. I'm, I, I'm very random. Yes. OK, so when when you're communicating to people, you have to be able to figure out what style they are. Yes. Otherwise, how you speak is not going to come over well. Um, so it's interesting because you guys are random. There's no doubt about that. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm trying to figure out whether or not there is a, a concrete or an abstract where that all sits. Because typically people who are random are all over the place, right? They, they, they don't like to be question, answer, question, answer. And, and frankly, this is a fun conversation. So I really like the fact that we're, we're uh, mixing this all up. Um, but usually too, they also like a lot of words. And so in a way you guys use a lot of words, but you don't like it when I use a lot of words. So I'm, it's really quite interesting. Ah, well, okay, so I can respond to that. I think when we use a lot of words, we actually aren't saying a whole lot and we assume that I you agree. know that. I agree, there's a lot of filler. Yes, there's a ton of filler. Um, and so I actually don't think we're as random as you think. I think what's going on is we don't prepare for the podcast. So we just sort of ask, what seem like random questions well, filters, until we find smart. something we can launch into. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> so then once we find something we can launch into, I think we're linear. Really? Makes, I would argue. Yeah, well, you keep arguing. I, 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 this is the, the, the beauty of this thing, if there is such a, a, oh, a description. Oh, no there's no beauty in this. No. Is, that, is that in the randomness, sometimes we discover something interesting. Well, what's your or, favorite? Or, thing? or we've had a good time, and yeah. and the yeah. end is the journey, not not the end. How's that well, for a profound bullshit statement? It comes down to the cave, the man cave, or whatever it's called. It's the, the thing cave. No, 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 no. You're, the you're, neutral cave. You're, no, you're you're soiling my my beautiful analogy. No, as usual. I, I don't know how the cave came in, into being. Really? Listen, it's it's fun bantering. The way I look at it is with the two of you. Is I know that you're both um, super bright and super capable and i look at this as you let me into your okay here you go david here's one for you you let me into your man cave and we just had some good fun bantering around yes correct no i agree i agree but we've learned a little um no forget learning okay learning so is so overrated it's so last year it's uh, so, <laughs> so thank you karen this is great we've actually broken all of our records that we're at an hour 20 almost right now are we well, that mine says that. Yeah. yeah could, could be. Yeah. yeah. So but, thank but you. Tru but truly, thank you. And and uh, what I would say is, if there's any interesting companies or professors or groups up there that uh, you want to introduce into this nightmare, let us know. Oh, I don't know why anyone would want to do that, but. And and may we have you along as the guest co-host. <laughs> sure, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, that that night. would actually be a good idea. Yeah, you could you could prove to them why. I guess if there's any value, it would be that they should, when they're done with the podcast, they'll know why they're happy they're in Canada and not in the United States. Well, why is that? Oh, they want to listen to this shit all the time. <laughs> that's a longer pod. That's a different podcast. <laughs> I'd re I'd refer you to the last week of American television, and we'll leave it all at right. that. Thank yeah. you. That was great. Don't watch TV anymore. It's, it's wise. Thank you. Well, listen, Thank guys, you. it's been a lot of fun. Um, I hope this will stack up very high in your uh, failure rating. And <laughs> Our biggest failure. <laughs> I hope I'm your biggest failure yet. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. So Thank, you. So Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. again. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. Oh,